one sat alone beside the highway begging his eyes were blind the light he could not see he clutched his old rags and shivered in the shadows then jesus came and bade his darkness flee it's time to open the word once again with evangelist lester roloff on the family altar program Glory for all is changed when jesus comes to stay Has it been since you got mad? Let me preface my message by saying I wouldn't give you a dime for a cow pasture full of preachers that couldn't get mad. You say, what's wrong with this generation? Too many nice preachers, manicured ministers. They aim to please. We can put the blame on the president, the government, the school system, all of which are in bad shape tonight in this country. But the original trouble started in the pulpit. The preacher is God's standard bearer. I went through some clippings today, and uh, I tell you, every time the mail comes, many people send in Various clippings. Boy kills his brother reenacting television scene. Went through the exact thing. Used the same words. Came from the UPI Columbus, Ohio. Is starting a two year effort to cut tube time in half. We might be criticized for using such a strong word as addiction, but it's the truth, said Catherine Burns, presiding our president of the sponsoring Birmingham Parent Teacher Student Association. You know, the stand I've taken for the last 25 or 30 or 35 years is becoming a little more popular. I was a lonely fool for a long time, but I've got more company all the time. Notice the parent teachers deal got together. The association has won the backing of the teachers union and the school board in the 25,000 student Birmingham School District for its attempt to turn families from television to such activities as jogging, bicycling, hiking, or hobby working. A report from an association study committee said television was injuring many children in that area. Now, here's the alarming statement to some people, not to me. The theory that TV watching itself rather than specific programs is harmful. Think of it. They hit at the root of it right there. They said we're not fighting certain programs, we're fighting TV itself. That almost sounds like a preacher, doesn't it? And they call it the plug-in drug. Forty hours a week, they say. Well, the Lutherans to attend the session, a pastor dressed as a clown, and a black jazz composer will lead worship experiences for more than 500 pastors, delegates, and visitors attending the convention of the Upper New York Synod, Lutheran Church in America, at Casanova College near Syracuse on June the 4th through the 6th, and there's the picture of the idiot. Nothing but a long nose painted up with a dunce hat on his head and he calls himself a preacher. And 500 preachers are to be led in their worship of the devil. Folks, it's not hard to figure out what's wrong if we just go ahead and apply the right remedy. Yes, here's some old-time criminals. Boys, four and six, confess to murder. 
That's 10 years put together. They killed an old woman. Four years old and six years old. And they made their confession. Dear friend, I say that to say it's time for somebody to get mad. I have many others, but I'm going to save them from some of the time. You have your Bible? Turn with me to the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verse 26. Ephesians, chapter 4. No doubt you've heard me, and yet I realize we have a new generation of young people all the time in our homes and new radio friends. In this fourth chapter, verse 26, there's a command in three words. Be ye angry. Now that's the command. You'd say, well, what if I don't want to get angry? You'll sin. The Bible said in sin not. The way to keep from being in sin is to get mad. You'd say, it's hard on my digestive system. Well, if you have righteous indignation, God will bless you for it. The Bible said, be angry and sin not. And then he said, let not the sun go down. On your wrath. Now, I realize what I was taught when I went through Baylor and seminary. Be sure you get in a good humor by sundown. It means just the opposite. Don't ever let the sun go down on your wrath. Don't ever let your wrath die out. Don't let your wrath die out. Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down on your wrath. Now notice the next verse. Neither give place to the devil. The best way in the world to keep from giving place to the devil is to stay mad at him. If you're mad enough at the devil, you won't bid him influence. You won't make a reservation for him. Neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more but rather let him labor. Amen. That's that unknown word. Labor. Working with his hands the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that need it. Manual labor is not just the Latin American. That's work. Man that makes a machine, something could go wrong with it. Did you know that? When I pray at the end of the runway, as I have many times, I'd say, Lord, now you know man put this thing together and something could happen to it, and I'm going to ask you to look at it. But you talk about work. And uh, he said, uh, we're to work and to labor with our hands in order that we might have something to give. Somebody. Did you know that that's the reason we're supposed to work? Not to keep, but to give. The Bible said we're to work with our hands that we might have something to give somebody that's in trouble and in need. When you work to get, instead of to give, you'll be sick before it's over. That's what's wrong with this old selfish world tonight. Turn to Psalm chapter 7. Psalm chapter 7. What's God's attitude? And I'll give you the supreme illustration of the Bible before I'm through tonight. It'll be chapter 7. And verse 11, God judges the righteous and God is angry with the wicked once a year. No, sir, every day. Now, you know what that means? God, and I said reverently because I know he's a God of love, God is mad 24 hours a day at sin. He knows what it does to people. He knows every funeral. He knows every drunkard. He knows every dopehead. He knows every little lonely prostitute in the home of isolation tonight and sin and stare and pride. He watches all of it. And he knows what did it. He saw the devil walk up in the garden and raise the question about the word of God. He saw the first murder out in the field when Cain raised a stick or a hoe 
and beat his brother to death. And the first man that ever died was a Christian. He was covered by the blood. He saw the first funeral. He saw the sewing circle make something besides fig leaf aprons. He saw them make a burial suit for their boy. He saw them as they became their own pallbearers and put their boy in the grave. He heard Cain as he said, my punishment is greater than I can bear with a mark on his forehead, and he couldn't die, but he had to live in a lonely exile. God stays mad at sin. He knows what sin does, but the wages of sin is death. Righteousness exalted the nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. The wicked shall be turned into hell, and but sin is a reproach to any people. Ah, listen. God knows he has a right to be mad at sin. He loves the sinner, but he hates sin. God is angry with the wicked. The Bible said he loves righteousness and hates iniquity. Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 9. Now then, quickly, I want to give you what Jesus' attitude was. And in the first place, he gave us this verse, Be ye angry and sin not. You know when we had great revivals? It's when the preachers got mad at the devil and sinned. You realize, and I referred to it one day, maybe an interview or in broadcast during these birthday days, that there was a time when preachers would preach on nothing but sin for 14 days. Every night, every night, every night, they'd cry out against sin. Oh, the community would uprise and get mad, and people had threatened to run the preacher out of town and tar and feather and all the rest of it. But that old preacher would come up the next night, and if he found out something was wrong, he'd tell about it, and he'd preach. Two solid weeks he'd preach on sin. Oh, you talk about, and dear friend, I'm not too old to remember the time in Hearn, Texas, I didn't know it. We were there in the meeting. Brother Earl Goodman, Mrs. Goodman, Miss Francis was there uh, playing the organ. There was a move on downtown. Very definitely said, we're going to run him out of town. And uh, they threatened to do a lot. I didn't even know it until the latter part of the meeting and the power of God began to fall and God vindicated his work. I've had all sorts of things like that to happen across the years. Uh, but when you crowd against sin, and there's no way to have revival without a revival of the sinfulness of sin. There's got to be conviction before there can be conversion. And if there's no conviction, there's no conversion, and the greater conviction, the greater conversion, and there's no need joining the church and heading for the tranks to be baptized until you get converted. And a man be in Christ, he's a what? That's right, new creature. Old things. There goes your liquor and your cigarettes and all the rest of it ought to go. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new. I want to give you an illustration. When I came into this city 34 years plus, I preached exactly what I'm preaching now. The house was packed and jammed. There was chairs in the aisle at the Second Baptist. Every service. Wednesday night, and Sunday night and Sunday morning, and we had great, I preached the same thing then I'm preaching now. But there has been a falling away. Did it ever dawn on you that Christ has been unwelcome in every generation? Do you realize that the Holy Spirit is, is as despised today as Jesus was? I made a statement last night, I'll make it again. I've got more friends tonight in this world than Jesus Christ ever had. I've got more people that will go to court with me today when I, and go to jail with me today than he ever had while he was on this earth. You say, what do you think that means? It probably means I'm not as much like Jesus as I ought to be. Dear friends, it's not the lack of friends that bothers me. It's the abundance of friends that bothers me. But oh, when I look across this old nasty nation of ours and see the changes that have taken place, when I look at Corpus Christi and the church is empty on Sunday night and empty on Wednesday night and uh, evangelism and soul and, and fires have burned down to cold ashes 
There's something wrong. And it's all the way, all across the country. When I see my Baptist, as Dr. Truett used to say, my Baptist Zion backslide, get cold, modernistic, liberalistic, indifferent, and dead, never cries out again. I see the women's change in the way they dress. I see the men become sissies. I see the preachers begin to have their hair done instead of cut. I see the little Hollywood uh, fellas trotting around, you know, and trying to promote and talk about religious focus and weekend revival. Brother, we need a genuine revival that will get people back uh, to the Word of God. Yes, I was thinking about that old team model. My daddy had a way of convicting me. Back in the days when I, were, I was coming up, we had what we call a, a, a car shed. We didn't call it no garage. To me, a garage is some place you take your car to get it fixed. But uh, we had a little old car shed, and it'd go up, and there was boards in it. That was back when people took care of the equipment. I want you to know, listen, that old T-model eased up in there, and my dad pulled up that emergency and cut off that uh, T-model motor, and then we closed the doors, homemade doors, of course, and we closed those doors and put the plank in those two slots and it's locked up. And my daddy, I can see it and remember, and that old T-model, somebody asked me if I could drive it. I said, no problem at all. I mean, I cut my teeth in the T-model. And uh, But uh, my daddy went out and, and he, on some cold morning, some cold morning, he'd, he'd go around. Of course, we didn't have any self-starters. Boy, that's a newfangled invention. <coughs> we had to crank at the front of it. Oh, how many arms have been broken cranking the team up? That's right. You better watch that spark. <laughs> but anyhow, my daddy would get out and he'd wind that thing up and he'd crank and directly he'd peep his head out. You know, he's sweating up a storm on a cold morning. he says, say, Sally, bring the tea kettle. You know what that means? He's going to heat her up. Boy, he took off that brass radiator cap and poured that hot water in there, you know, and he'd get out and crank again. My daddy was red in the face, and he'd crank. And, brother, when my daddy gets going like that, don't get in his way here. I mean, don't cross him, see? I mean, I don't know what he thought, but uh, he was careful about what he said. But uh, he was trying to crank. And the next step, he said, I'm going to jack up the hind wheel. And he'd take a little jack, you know, Boy, I'd see that little old wheel, you know, and he'd go backwards and forth, and after a while, that thing would get started. But one morning, my daddy went out, and he didn't have trouble getting it started. I had all the trouble that morning myself. My little sister, Thelma, new girl to be interested in this, she was younger than Lester, and I was the youngest boy. It became my lot to play with Thelma. And, oh, listen, you talk about dolls. You talk about uh, nice things. She had them. She was the only little girl in our family with three boys. And she came along sort of last. And so it'd be my... And so one day I got one of her most beautiful dolls. I mean, that is back in the days. Seemed like the dolls were prettier then. Seemed like they're sort of mechanical looking now. You know, sort of dumb looking. But back in those days, the little dolls, they just looked like a little baby. And I took her most precious doll. Not because I loved dolls. I didn't. I was a boy. Yeah. I'd on my way to making a man. Had a hard time getting there, but I wanted to be a man. It was a burden to me. My mom would say, Lester, now you go play with them. I said, Mama, I'd rather go ride old days. said, you go play with them. Now, she don't have anybody to play with. I'd go in there, and I'm telling you, them would make all sorts of hot cakes, and she'd cook up a meal, and I'd have to sit there and make out like I was eating them mud pies and all the rest. Well, that is a... Huh? And so one morning, I just kind of, I guess, got disgusted, and I thought, well, I'll just try me something. I took that little old doll, and I got it, and I eased out to the car shed. My dad had already opened the doors, and he got in the old T-model. He didn't go around like he did old uh, Dave told me a while ago. said, there's a door, and he said, my dad never would go around getting the door. He just threw it put over the outfit, you see, and sit down. And, and, and uh, sissies went around the other side and got in. But anyhow, uh, I took that doll, and when my daddy got in the car, nobody was watching. I took that doll, and I put it, the head, right down under the back wheel. I mean, that doll head right there. And then I, I, I backed off 
to watch and see what is going to happen. And you believe me, it happened. I want you to know it happened. Listen, I saw him. He put that old Ford, that old T model in reverse in the middle, you know. And he put, and he pushed down. I heard, mm -hmm. and it just didn't want to go right quick, you know. And all of a sudden, boom! He ran over the head of that dog. It sounded like a shot. I said, I didn't intend for it to do that. My daddy jumped out of that thing. He run around there. And he looked at nothing but the torque or the body or whatever it is. Just no head. The thing had exploded, just busted all the pieces. And, of course, he didn't say sunny or honey. He said, Lester. I said, yes, sir. And that's where the fireworks started. <laughs> Brother, one of the hardest, to the tune of Thelma's weeping. And, of course, I joined her. We both wept for different purposes, but we wept. She wept high ball. There's a difference. Well, he brought real conviction. He made me realize I had done wrong. And that's the last time he broke me from breaking little dog head <laughs> under the back. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. I said on the radio something today. And one of the puzzles of my life, Brother Mark and Brother Alfred, two of our directors, and D.H. Strader would have been here tonight, which would have made it unanimous with Miss Francis and Brother Gene and Brother Mark and Brother Alfred. But uh, their electrical got on fire in their big motorhome today as they were packed and ready to drive into Corpus. And what a delightful time we have when we get together two or three times a year, but they didn't get to come. But... I said something today, and I thought something. And during this season of the year, it's so easy to reminisce. And that is the Lord's goodness. You know, the Bible said the goodness of the Lord leadeth men to repentance. I, I have a hard time figuring out. Really, I do. I know more about it than you do. I know more than my mother and daddy knew. Oh, listen. My mother, and she was so full of mercy and forgiveness. And she was so tearful when something went wrong with me. And even in my sin days when uh, their hearts were broken. And uh, when I've seen my mother with golden tears chasing each other down her cheeks and, and she'd say, son, it wasn't your fault. Oh, it just wasn't your fault, but it was my fault. But she didn't believe me. I remember when the old boys, old Cat Brown and Odell and, well, all the rest of them would go home with me. After God called me to preach and I'd go to the little country church and preach. And the people... They respected and loved me. And the old timers were so kind and would so encourage this young preacher to keep on keeping on. And the young people would come with whom I was brought up and they'd go home with me and back to the old homestead there. And my mother would plan for 15 or 20 and oh, the big long homemade table and benches and chairs and all the rest of it and the old tablecloth and all the nice things and the big four-layer cake that my mama would stack up. And uh, one of the things that always puzzled me when I was a little child, is how in the world my mother could guess just how much filling she needed. And I'd stand there and drool all over the kitchen, waiting for the pan. I mean, just wait for the pan. Chocolate, that's back in my chocolate days. And all the rest. And I'd just stand there and wait and wait and and she'd just put it on top of every layer. And then when she got the top covered, she'd go around the whole thing. Round and round, and I'd stand, and I'd wait. And directly she'd say, now, son, you can lick the pan. I said, yes, ma'am, that's about all there is left. Just <laughs> pan. But when we'd come home after the morning service, we'd sit at the table, and old Cat Brown and Odell and all the rest of them, I tell you, mischievous as we used to be, they said, Ms. Roloff, do you remember when Lester... Uh, did so and so. 
And my mother almost turned into an angel. And she said, no, I don't remember. I don't think you ever did that, did you? You don't remember? No, she said. I I, all she could think about is her preacher boy. Standing in the pulpit. Telling about Jesus. All the force of my life was gone. All the mistakes and all the hot tears that rolled out of her cheeks have been dried away. As I stood in the pulpit and called sinners to repent. Brother, that's a little like God in me. I'm glad he's forgiven and he's forgotten. Ain't no need you reminding God of my past sins. He ain't going to remember you. He may rebuke you for even bringing them up. None of your business. I'm glad that's true of you too. You little girls that come in. You precious old boys with your white shirts on. With an old ugly, dirty past. Many defeats. Running from the law. Laying in some old cold climbing in jail. Day and night. And yet, God's forgiven. All that's in the past. You're a new creature in Christ Jesus. Your name's been written in the book of life. God's kissed all your sins away. Don't have anything to worry about. Nothing. Oh, one day. Somebody told me, must have been the Lord. He said, you don't have any more to worry about than God does. And God never worries. Would you let me give an illustration? I closed the message. I'm scared to look at my watch, but I'm through now. Back in my boyhood days, I guess the most exciting time, the most fearful time, the most frightening thing, I was the most nervous, I was more nervous than everybody else in the family put together. I was scared of the dark. I was scared of everything. I mean, I was nervous. I couldn't sleep. I, I had at least, I rode probably six nightmares a night. And I never had a saddle on one of them. I still have them. Man, the other night, the other night, right? I mean, last week. If I hadn't woke up when I did, I'd have been done for it. I know I would. <laughs> now you talk about a nightmare. I had it. That is a nightmare. It's a horrible time. But oh, isn't it dusty to wake up? <laughs> oh, you, you, you kind of enjoy the nightmare then because you feel so good not to be hurt. But listen, I had so many nightmares until I, I really lived my name. I rolled off the bed many, many nights. But I'd hit the floor. My head had, and, and we didn't have carpet. Fact is, we were just delighted to have wall to wall floor. And uh, I'd hit that old hard, cold floor, and my mama would say, Lester, did you have a bad dream? I said, it's over. I'm all right. You know, and I'd climb back on the bed and try to go to sleep again. Well, I know what it is. I know what it is. But one day we went visiting. We came back. And uh, you talk about some excitement. We walked in that old ranch home. And listen, I'll guarantee you, in there, in the, uh, in the kitchen, in the, what we call the dining room, where the old homemade table, was a great big pool of blood, human blood. And oh, listen, man, it scared me so bad. I was the least one in the family. And I stayed so close to Mama, and she got away from me. I grabbed my papa, and we walked down the hall, and there was a trail of blood. And we went in the room, in, the, in, in, the, in what we call the front room, and there was a little chair, Pam, uh, Liz and Pazan, no, not Liz and Pazan, uh, Thelma's little chair. And she was, and whoever came, sat in that chair, and the blood ran out on the floor. Oh, listen, we trailed right on down the hall and went out to the chicken trough, a round concrete chicken trough, and it was filled with blood. Where he'd washed himself off, and we knew there had been something horrible happened in that, uh, that, that our house that day. And oh, listen, we just, we, we were perplexed, and, and finally we began to search and to look, and we found out that uh, my neighbor my playmate, Edwin Jordan. Now, when they moved to town, they called it Jordan, but it was Jordan back in those times. Mr. and Mrs. Jordan and Edwin would come. And so he walked up the road. He got up home, and he said, um, a colored man shot me down at Mr. Wolof. Oh, listen. They called Dr. B.W.D. D. Hill. He jumped in the old T-model and he came down those old dusty roads and he came in and he looked and sure enough, a hole went all the way through. All the way through. Right in here. You know what happened? 
Dr. Hill, wise old Christian doctor, said to Edwin, what happened? He said, colored man shot me down at Mr. Roloff's, and he said, uh, he shot me right. Dr. Hill took his hand. Now, in the meantime, Mr. Jordan had buckled on his big 44 and gone down to Mr. Roloff's, and he was on a manhunt. That big old pistol hanging on his hip, ready to shoot anybody, black or white, red, pink or brown, that might have shot his boy. Talking about something tonight. Dr. Hill, he raised up his hand, and he said something that's awful black around there. He must have been mighty close to you. He said, Edwin, did you shoot yourself? And tears started rolling. And Edwin told the story. He said, you know, I went down to Mr. Roloff's house and said I found in the cabinet the old-fashioned safe with a little bump on the side. And said when I got there, the door was locked and I couldn't get in. And he said, you know, something seemed to say, well, you know, the window's not locked and you can climb in and get your glass of water. And then, you know, it's hot. And so he said... And then he said, seemed like something seemed to say, you know Miss Roloff has a lot of cookies in there. And said, you know she wouldn't mind if you got some cookies. And so I went in there and opened up the safe. And then I looked up on the top and I saw a lot of pecans and nuts and walnuts and hickory nuts and all the rest of them. And I just decided I'd get into the pocket pool. And I got up in a chair and I looked up on top of the thing and I found a little pistol. I found a little pistol. That was my daddy's hog-killing pistol. And he said, you know, there was a little place there on the side of it. And he said, I just kept a fooling with it. And, and yeah. Now then, I said that to say this, dear friend. Sin is a lot worse after you commit it. He thought, well, my... There'd be nothing wrong with that. And when he shot himself, he fell on the floor. And directly he said, you know, I realized that I wasn't dead. <laughs> and then I decided I better wash off the blood. And then I had to tell a lie to prop up what I'd done. I could have gotten somebody killed. But you know, when he confessed it, and Edwin bears a mark in his hand today, we need to be mad at sin. Amen. His sin caught him. And of course the Roloff family were delighted that he didn't get killed and we loved him and played with him. But Edwin Jordan tonight remembers the time when he shot a hole through his hand. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down on your wrath. He that stole you better steal no more. Neither give place to the devil. Let's stand together. Now while every head is bowed tonight, I'm going to let you make the decision standing right where you are. We're going to sing. And right where you are, I want you to say, Lord, help me stay mad at the devil and sin and help me to love Jesus. And let me tell you this. You will hate sin in the same proportion that you love Jesus. He's the one that hated sin the most. Sin did the most to him that it's ever done to anybody. Of course, it was on the outside, but oh, on the inside, his heart broke because of sin. Talk about a miscarriage of justice. Talk about trouble and heartache and loneliness and no lawyer. And no place to lay his head than his own received him not. And tonight, right where you are, I want you to just say with me as we close the service, I want to be thy hope. I want to be thy will. Oh, Lord. Take me, break me, then mold me, and I want to do
uh, Father, finish up the service and bless every heart that's here tonight. Meet every need and grant, Lord, that we might hate sin and never let our hatred for sin die out. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us today on the Family Altar Program with Lester Roloff. You may listen to the preaching and the special music of the Family Altar Program 24 hours a day when you visit our ministry website, roloff.org. We love hearing from our listeners. If this broadcast has been a blessing to you, please write to us at Roloff Evangelistic Enterprises, P.O. Box 100, Fort Thomas, Arizona, 855 855- Three, six. Again, that's Roloff Evangelistic Enterprises, P.O. Box 100, Fort Thomas, Arizona, 85536. This broadcast is made possible by the prayers and financial support of listeners like you. Thank you for partnering with us, and remember that Christ is the answer.